Hey, and welcome back to the Relationship School's Smart Couple Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis, and I am grateful to be here with you right now. After rocking out an amazing Embracing Conflict weekend here in Boulder, Colorado, right? Over 80 people came from 22 states and six countries to come embrace conflict with the Relationship School and finally get real and get educated there. And man, was it intense and so good. And if you were there, thank you. You rock. That was amazing, right? That was so fun. And I appreciate all of you that came and pushed yourselves. It was such an honor to meet you, to hang with you, to get real with you. And I just so applaud your courage and bravery. It was, uh, and just your truth, you know, your willingness to be real and, and vulnerable. Because as so many of you said, gosh, I, I can't believe people talk like this. And I feel so seen and feel so understood for the first time. There were people there that said, I've, I have never felt this understood in my life. And I've been married for 15 years and it was the first time my partner got me or something like that. You know, I mean, there was, there were some revolutionary moments uh, there was a couple that was about to break up and they, um, I don't know where they are now. You guys know who you are, but uh, they asked for help and I think I helped them and I think the group helped them. So we had uh, so many intimate moments, tons of tears, lots of laughs, uh, lots of discomfort, right? You know, you know, we, we leaned in to discomfort. That was one of those takeaways was if you want to get good at conflict, you got to be willing to be uncomfortable. All right. Yeah. So if you want to come next year, we're going to do it again. Absolutely. And it's just going to be better. And we're going to have a, probably a bigger crew and it's going to be a blast. So reach out in the smart couple Facebook group to someone. If you want to hear about it, you can certainly meet someone that was there and get kind of the, their download or their take on how it was for them. Now, if you left that community uh, that weekend and you're like, oh shit, what do I do now? Or if you didn't get to come, remember the place, what, one of the fundamental takeaways from the weekend for people, if I could speak for all of them, was you got to practice the tools. Practice, practice, practice. And the Relationship School Roots community is the place to do that. They meet twice a month and you practice listening until it's second nature. You practice validating someone's feelings. You practice sharing impact until it's second nature. So to me, it's a no-brainer to join a community like this to learn and practice. Okay, this is something therapy doesn't give you. Therapy doesn't give you a community of people to practice with. It gives you one person that's got a full plate that isn't available outside that hour. Um, the relationship school gives you a community where people can you can talk whenever you want and practice when the two of you make the space in your schedule uh, with people from all over the world. So I think it's pretty amazing. So if you want to play with us, go to relationshipschool.net slash roots to apply. And I think you're going to see from the people in there that it takes practice to get results. And the people that have practiced do get results. End of story. All right, I've got to give a little context for this next episode, mostly because I get requests from gay folks saying, will you have a gay expert on your show? And then they might complain a little bit that I'm not using inclusive language. I'm, I'm very heteronormative sort of in my presentation. And that's true. I'm not speaking in an inclusive way always. And I use extremely heteronormative language, man, woman, male, female, husband, wife, guy, girl, um, it's, and pretty much every guest speaks very similarly. So while most of you are okay with that, there's a small group saying, hey, it'd be cool if you had some gay couples or some gay relationship experts. And I agree with you. So please know that I'm, I'm game and I just don't um, have a lot of gay couples that would be willing to be interviewed here. And I don't know a lot of gay relationship experts. That's really the the limitation of mine. So if you have any recommendations, certainly email us, all right, and let us know. 
While over the years I have worked with lots of gay couples and gay individuals around their relationship problems and challenges, I am not gay myself, so it's hard to speak directly about that or know what that's like from the inside. And that's an issue for some people. It's not an issue for others. Regardless, I felt like it was important to get a gay relationship expert on the show. So here we go. In this episode, I'm interviewing Jean Malpas. Jean is the director of the Gender and Family Project at the Ackerman Institute for the Family, director of the International Training and Psychotherapist in Private Practice in New York City. He's presented on issues of gender, sexuality, addiction, couple, and family therapy in the U.S., Israel, China, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Belgium, and Canada. He's published several articles and chapters on his work with lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals, couples, and families, including the Family Process article, Between Pink and Blue, a multidimensional approach to gender, non-conforming children and their families. Okay, this guy is very well-versed in terms of the gender, gender issues and gay relationships, and I think you're really going to enjoy this one, okay? Let us know, give us some feedback, and let's hear from Mr. Jean Malpas. Welcome to the show, Jean Malpas. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, really psyched you're here. Um, so, Jean, tell us about you. Who are you, where do you live, etc., and your relationship status, please. Great. Um, well, uh, my name is Jean, and I am uh, a psychotherapist in New York City. I'm actually sitting here in my office uh, in Manhattan looking at the Flatiron um, building and fairly blue sky, so things are good. Um, and uh, I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm also the director of the Gender and Family Project at the Ackerman Institute and the director of international training at the Ackerman Institute, also in New York City. Cool. And relationship status? So I am, I'll tell you a little bit more about me personally and how I identify. That's often kind of how I begin conversations with, with clients and with colleagues and with trainees. Right. Uh, so I identify as a uh, white cisgender gay man. Uh, the pronouns that I use for myself are he, him, and his. I grew up in Belgium. So I grew up in the French speaking part of Belgium uh, and I finished uh, undergrad and grad school there and then came to New York um, many years ago after that uh, to kind of start my practice and, and my life and uh, been blessed to be able to stay here. And um, about 13 years ago, met um, the men of my life uh, and so I've been married to my husband now for seven years, together for 13. Um, mm. And uh, we live together in Brooklyn. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Uh, and for the listener, cisgender, that feels like a, maybe a newer term. Will you help us understand that term? Absolutely. So, you know, I do a lot of work with transgender youth and their families and communities in school. And cisgender actually means um, when I were assigned sex at birth, so whether we're male, female, intersex, uh, is aligned or not with our gender identity. So when I were assigned sex, so I was assigned sex, uh, male at birth, is mm -hmm. aligned with how we experience ourselves personally and subjectively. So I identify as a, I identified as a boy and now as a man. So they are aligned. So I am cisgender. Cis means aligned with. Uh, when oh. there is a difference between how what the doctor said we were, how we were assigned at birth, or how the world sees us, and how we feel about ourselves, we can use the word transgender. Okay, got it. Thank you. Nice. And how did you become a psychotherapist? I always am so curious how people got into that. Okay, well, I think that question could be for, you know, I could answer that for the rest of the hour. So I'm going to probably <laughs> give you sort of a, a short version. The short <laughs> version, or at least the, the interesting version. You know, I, I often ask that question to, my, to the people that I, that I train or work with. And my answer is I feel like I, I'm trained as a family therapist. And I feel like every uh, person who's a family therapist was actually uh, someone who was a family therapist in their own family, but unfortunately failed and is now trying with others, you know? So mm -hmm. that's how I feel. You know, I was in a family where there were a lot of things going on and where um, 
for whatever reason, I was just very aware about, you know, the, the problems my parents had, that my siblings had, and sort of just very aware of relationships and conflicts and what could make things better. But I don't think you can be really your own family, family's therapist. So yeah. um, it's a little tricky. Um, but it definitely made me interested in what helped people grow, um, get along, succeed and achieving the goals that they have together and just experience love and being able to be on, you know, life's journey together. So that's kind of really the heart of it um, for me. Oh, that's cool. And uh, what age were you when you knew you were cisgender and like um, a gay man? So that's a great question, you know, like I think, and I'm inviting everyone sort of listening along right now to ask themselves the same question. Um, you know, often uh, the, the young trans people I, I work with have a very clear recollection of when they start feeling like, wait, the way I feel about myself, the way I see myself um, does not fit with how the world is seeing me or the pronoun people are using for me or the, my name or my, my outfit, my clothes, my hair. Uh, but when um, we are cisgender very often, we sort of don't remember the time when we realize, oh, I am a boy. I, the world tells me I'm a boy and I am a boy and that fits, right? Because it, it does yeah. fit or we don't have that experience of distress. But I feel like I got from very, very early on messages from my family, from the world, from school, from friends about what it means to be a boy and what it means yeah. to fit in the blue box, right? Like uh, there's the pink yeah. box and the blue box and would better stay inside of it. Um, and I remember family members um, telling me, you know, cause I was a pretty gender expensive, pretty feminine boy. And I just, I had lots of girlfriends and I thought that dancing and singing and, you know, at, at recess was much more interesting than playing football or anything yeah. else like that personally. Yeah. So, uh, but I remember my family telling me, look, it, it's okay when I was a young teen, it's okay for you to be gay, but don't, don't be one of those queens. And what wow. that meant, meant, don't be feminine. And it yeah. certainly meant don't be transgender. But it's also like, even if you're gay, you'd better stick to stereotypical prescribed masculinity. Totally. You know, Come on. So strong. And yeah. it is so strong. And, you know, and it probably was something that was in passing, but I never forgot it. And yeah. uh, so I've always, I've known forever that I am a boy. I've always known that I was different that I loved that I have a lot of masculinity and femininity in me um, and I've also I knew from pretty early on that I was gay I remember that um, you know even in in sort of in grade school remembering that it had nothing to do with sex with adult sexuality but remembering that you know I had crushes on on other boys I just yeah I was sort of like interested and oriented to like create more connection with um, other young boys my age. So um, it kind of came very gradually. And I often say, you know, there's not one way to be straight. There's not one way to be gay. There's not one way to be transgender. There's not one way to be cisgender. And that's my, that's my story. I can certainly not speak on behalf of all gay people, or all cisgender people, all trans people. Um, I know uh, many clients I've worked with and many uh, friends of mine have come to terms with their own identity, whether as a gay person or as a trans person um, at a very, at a later age or at a different time of mm. their life. And, and that's just as legitimate and as just as um, developmentally normal as someone who um, comes out to themselves earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing a slice of your story. It feels really important to me. And, course, and another conversation we could go down the rabbit hole into is certainly the conditioning, just the gender conditioning, uh, you know, that men are still just Anytime. shoved in this box of this is, this is a man, this is a boy. Mm -hmm. I, I've written a lot about that. And so I, I just love hearing from you on uh, your experience. Um, in your own relationship, I want to just talk about your relationship for a minute of 13 years how do you guys, I'm guessing you and your husband have had challenges along the way. Is that None. fair to say? None, ever. <laughs> that's, that's what people always say, no, no, none. 
<laughs> and the big laugh comes. Of course. Yeah. So, so what's, um, what are some of the challenges you, you guys have had to navigate as a couple and how do you get through them? Um, I think some of the challenges that we've had or some of the big questions that we've had to navigate as, as a couple, um, and I think that's actually a question that comes up for any couple, um, whether straight, gay, lesbian, you know, um, is uh, the question of, of boundaries, the question of exclusivity, monogamy versus open relationship versus polyamorous relationship. I think that mm. You know, I've had the chance to, to be with my husband for 13 years. I've had the chance to work with folks in couples therapy and individual therapy, um, sometimes for just almost as long, if not longer, actually. I've worked with some folks for more than 15 years. And, yeah, well. you know, we're, it, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to, to be committed to one person uh, mm -hmm. and to hold a certain loyalty and uh, honesty and at the same time, um, manage the complexity of feelings that we have as human beings and as sexual human beings with, mm -hmm. with you know complex feelings that we can have for other people in our lives complex attractions that we can have and um, and I you know one thing I know is that um, every couple each couple really needs to come to terms and define what their own boundary is what their own sexuality is what loyalty is going to mean to them and mm -hmm and say, I, it's almost like there's no, um, there's no one size fits all. What is loyalty for you and your partner and loyalty in my partner might be, for me and my partner might, might look very different. So that's something yeah. that we, a conversation we had from the very beginning, you know, the assumption of, so are we gonna be monogamous? Are we gonna have an open relationship? Uh, what are we open to? What feels right? And and we're, we're fairly open about that. And I'm also fairly open in my, in my training and in my, uh, my work with my clients. And I've, we've always had an open relationship. And um, there are certainly sort of challenges that come with that. And mm -hmm. um, what often people think is sort of like, oh, so if you have an open relationship, it doesn't mean that sort of everything goes. Like, you know, how do you maintain a certain sense of intimacy and loyalty? And that's the first question that we had to answer is what's okay, what's not okay? What is gonna yeah. hurt your feelings? What is gonna hurt my feelings? What makes me feel like I'm your priority to some extent? Um, mm -hmm. What makes you feel like you're my priority? And um, if we have an experience with someone else, how do we handle it? Like what information do we wanna share with each other? Um, what are the kind of behaviors that are okay and not okay with other people? Like, are there things yeah. that are best safe for us and things that are okay um, in other circumstances with other people? So all of those conversations are great because you get to uh, good consensus together. Sometimes it's hard to get to the consensus. Sometimes it's, it's fairly simple, but also the conversation itself builds intimacy. Yeah, like, totally. Like face each other and be like having that level of honesty, that level of authenticity and integrity, it builds intimacy. Yeah, it does. You know, and also yeah, you're being real together big time. Yeah. And also for me, my premise about relationships is that we don't own the other person. That we all make a choice every day to have a certain level of commitment to someone. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that person owns us or that we're owned by that person at all. Yeah, great. And, you know, we don't I, I don't own my partner's body. I don't own my partner's sexuality. I don't own my partner's journey in life. I want him to be happy, to be fulfilled, um, to have a rich life. Uh, I want the same for myself. And I also want him to feel secure. I want him to know that I'm here for him and that I'm not gonna do anything that undermines him or us. And that that's my priority. So you now I'm using sort of the I voice here, but that's very much how I practice as well and how I sort of counsel yeah. people uh, yeah. to find that line between clear boundaries, clear commitment to something that's consensually and collaboratively decided, and at the same time really lets them have a life as rich as possible as they want it. Well, if I'm, if I'm him, I'm listening, I'm, I'm feeling like I have a lot of room to be me, and I'm feeling really cared about, you know, like 
you're, you consider my feelings, you care how I'm impacted by your choices and your behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, wow, (laughs) it feels really good. Um, So I'm guessing you guys have had to work hard to create that level of container, right? Where you can be that open, uh, but also boundaries like this is, you know, this is not okay for me. This is okay. Um, that kind of respect. It's awesome. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> uh, now, and I, I hope he does feel that way. <laughs> uh, I think so most of the time, but it's also easier said than done. You know, like there are plenty sure. of times when we make mistakes, you make mistakes and you're like, oh, I thought this was okay. Or I thought that was not undermining or feeling undermining to you. And yeah. It, And then I think that it really, like that's the other part of like, you know, the kind of conversations, the intimacy, the accountability um, is really important, but how you repair an injury is the- Yeah, oh, it's so essential. um, Research that's been done both with couples and with parent-child relationship that shows that the, um, the strongest form of attachment, the people who feel the most secure and connected to each other are not those who do not experience injury. And the same with like emotional injury, the same with parent-child relationships that dis- disruptions happen, fights mm-hmm. happen, you know, sort of really difficult experiences. But what matters the most is the ability to repair after. The ability yep. to come back to the table, the ability to say, I'm sorry. The ability to say, I can regulate myself and calm myself down enough to make room for your experience, to want to hear what it was like for you and to be accountable to whatever I've done that did that because it's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to problem solve whatever problem we had that made us feel this way to begin with. So um, yeah, we we certainly had lots of those. I mean, and, and sometimes easier and sometimes not. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Are you familiar with Dan Siegel's work at all? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We just interviewed him on the podcast and he's saying everything you're saying there. I mean, he's a part of that research, right? It's the, yeah. the repair after the rupture is the essential piece. Very it's awesome. Um, I want to kind of zoom out for and ask two sort of more meta um, conceptual questions uh, about gay relationships. So um, I was telling you this a little bit before on the podcast, but I wanted to make sure the listener heard this part. So I've been getting, you know, a significant enough number enough emails to warrant action, which is people saying, "Hey, Jason, your your perspective's great. Um, I love your podcast, and uh, I'm in a gay relationship. I'm gay, and you don't totally probably get me. And it'd be nice if you interviewed people that do. So that's part of the mo- motivation for this interview. And um, one of the questions that's come up is, as we're talking about your relationship and gay relationships, is is there a difference? This is maybe the silly, dumb question, but is there a difference between a gay relationship and a straight relationship in terms of how we talk about relationship and intimacy? Um, Obviously there's going to be some gaps that I certainly just can't speak to uh, Mm -hmm. for really any cultural group or subgroup that is, whether they feel marginalized or not, where I'm just not going to understand what it's like to be them. And so I can't really speak in a way to them, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm wondering, could you speak to that high level question? And then I, I guess the subset, the secondary question in that is, um, is your, like, what is your personal experience with that? Um, like what are gay couples wrestling with that straight couples are not? Mm-hmm. No, I, you know, I think, it's a really important question. It's a really good question. And it's a tricky one because in itself, it's sort of, it's a little reductive and I'll sort of unpack what I'm saying right. here. Um, and, and first of all, I'm glad that you're, you're kind of owning your location and your position. And you're saying, look, there are things I don't get. There are things I can't speak to um, because that's not where I'm coming from. And I'm, I'm getting requests about wanting to sort of locate this narrative, this show and wanting to expand it and invite other voices. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, you know, as I said earlier, I will, I'll do the same, the sense of like, I, I'll more than gladly talk about my perspective, my personal perspective and my, my perspective as a therapist working with a, a large number of gay couples. And at the same time, you know, clearly I won't speak on behalf of all gay couples and yeah. gay 
rules and you know right. the, you know the fact that i'm white the fact that i'm belgian american the fact that i grew up in an atheist family the, the fact you know like there are a number of things that have or you know so sort of the intersection of all these identities and experiences is so important and uh they influence how i have experienced myself as a as a gay man how i've, I've come to be the kind of partnership I formed and how I experienced life and relationships. And in some ways, you know, that's very much the awareness I use when I work with any couple. Like when two, two people come to me or two men come to me, like um, I'm certainly not going to think I get them because they're gay and I'm gay and therefore we understand each other. I'm going to want to know like what's been their experience growing up and yeah. come terms with their identity and sexuality and I'm not going to make the assumption they even share you know a lot of that experience it might have been I mean I've worked with um, multiracial multi um, linguistic uh, couples that had such different experiences of growing up even like north and south of the US and yeah. uh, or coming from religious families or class I mean just sort of like so all of that informs really like what we experience and what it means to come to come to terms with our sexuality and and be and celebrate ourselves and have a relationship that is healthy um so but i i also i think it's important that we don't completely sort of not answer the question by saying what i just said i think that right. there are some important uh parameters to think about differences but um, one is that um, we all bring our joys and pains in a relationship, right? We all bring our journey, our hopes, uh, our dreams, and then mm -hmm. all the more shitty, difficult stuff that has happened to us, uh, for better or for worse. And so, um, you know, when I train therapists to work with, with um, gay couples, um, and I'll speak specifically about gay male couples, um, I, um, I ask them to really pay attention to the experience of otherness that um, each individual has experienced in their life. The level of solitude or the level of support, the level of isolation or connection, the access to community, the fact that whether they were reflected and seen in their family or not, whether they were hiding or whether they could be, you know, joyful and proud, or whether they, uh, whatever it has meant for them to be themselves in their family and social context. And I'm asking people to not make assumptions about that. So there's yeah. often a level of otherness, of oppression, of, uh, of fear, of shame, of stigma, uh, hopefully, it's changing. Hopefully it's getting better in some ways and some, for some of us, but it, it is often there. And mm -hmm. I think that when we partner, we have to be mindful about what are the pains and the areas of shame that we bring to our partner and that are more likely to make us defensive, that are make, more likely to make us shut down uh, there are going to be our trigger points, our points of rupture, and how they're connected to our family experience, how they're connected to our social experiences and the ways we've been affirmed or oppressed. Um, I know there is a, a concept in, 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 in the mental health field of, called minority stress. And research has shown that um, members of, um, uh, and maybe the, even the term minority group, minority group is not um, most appropriate and affirming, but marginalized groups, you know, and maybe it should be a marginalized, marginalization of stress. Members of marginalized right. and oppressed groups um, are significantly impacted by a form of stress that members of privileged groups do not have. Yeah. Um, so that's the second question that I uh, ask the people that I train to work with gay couples to think about what is the level of support that this particular gay couple gets? Like who's there for them? Who's mm -hmm. their community? Who are the family members who embrace them? What rituals do they have to know that they matter to the world, that their relationship, whatever it is, whether it's an open relationship, polyamorous relationship, just, 
sex positive relationship, doesn't matter any of that, but who is seeing that, who's validating it, who is nurturing that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, you know, the federal or the state government, if it's not, you know, the, the place yeah. of faith. I mean, like who is taking on that very important mission of making them feel valued and honored? And um, safe, you know, like help, helping them feel safe in their own absolutely. skin and given this crazy world we're living in, you know? Absolutely, and just completely at the, the basic level, safe to be themselves and safe to, you know, have a relationship. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of hearing, if I can just reflect a, a little bit, that what I'm hearing is really taking into account the, mar if, if you want to call that term, the marginalized stress, right, mm -hmm. of, of what I've been through as, say, a gay person is going to be different than a straight person. And I'm bringing that stress potentially into my relationship and it's going to impact that relationship. Yeah. And I think that, you know, and the other side is true as well. So resilience and strength is also applicable here. Right. So, but yeah, I great. often ask my clients to say like, sort of, yeah, what, what areas of vulnerability, what areas of kind of tender points do you bring to your relationship? Because of who you are, because of your temperament, because of your upbringing, because of just your journey in life, don't judge it. Just notice where, where it gets tricky for you, where it gets sensitive and mm -hmm. all that enters into your relationship and own it. Don't judge it. Don't judge yourself. Don't shame yourself, but own it. And the same way, like, you know, um, you, we all have so much resilience and strength. And in particular, when we are, face lots of interpersonal and social challenges. So that's the other thing that I work with a lot with, with gay couples is like really tapping into the amazing resilience that each individual and, and the relationship itself has had to be. Yeah. And yeah, the warriorship would be what I call it. Like, you know, you have to, there's a certain level of warriorship that's required there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, I, you know, can think about it as kind of skill transfer. Like we're very good in an area, but not really good in another area. And, you know, so I remember, uh, I was working with a, a team um, and the, the, the therapist who was working with that couple was, um, it was a couple that was having a really hard time with communication and just basic kind of reliability and being kind of structured enough to understand each other. And, um, but in terms of their sex life and their uh, sort of like their sexual rules, they had it like to a T. They were like, so clear, so collaborative, mm. perfect communication. And then they were like getting in really kind of messed up situation like for like domestic, non-sexual kind of daily life stuff. Mm. And we, we really looked at, we're like, look, you're amazing. They have an open relationship. You're really great at how you created rules around that and how you respect them and how you talk and how you process things. Can we transfer this <laughs> to the rest of your life? And vice versa, so often. <laughs> You know, you look at resilience, you look at strength, um, and you think, oh, I, how do I bring this to my vulnerabilities? How do I apply these good yeah. skills that I have to yeah. do it where it's hard? Yeah, that's great. Nice. Um, okay. Uh, again, I'm getting, I'm getting um, that it is important, actually, to acknowledge that there is a difference. And to, um, if, if I'm working, you know, I've worked with plenty of gay couples and it seems to me in my experience that that's very true, that there's, uh, there's things people have been through that have not only strengthened them, but also created a lot of pain, right? And then that might impact my fear, my level of ability to attach, my ability to repair, uh, my ability to feel like I'm listening to you, all that stuff. Yeah. So it's and really useful. That, you know, absolutely. Uh, I, I would also add to come back to the question of, of sexual boundaries. And I, I certainly hope I don't come across as reducing gay male relationships to questions of sexuality, because obviously that would be reductive and offensive. And that's not at all what I believe. I think that all relationships, gay or straight, any relationship handles the question of desire and loyalty. Um, and, um, we see it and you know there's a lot of conversations these days about the question of affairs the question of cheating yeah. the question of um, the, the sort of the trauma or the difficulty of um 
extracurricular, extra commitment experiences. Um, and that is one thing that I have experienced in, in my, in the gay community and in the uh, gay male couples that I work with um, as often being a little bit more on the table. So that it doesn't mean that the issues are different. It doesn't mean that the, the work to do around loyalty and boundaries is different, but there is a kind of a given that we're going to have to talk about it. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think it avoids acting out uh, kind of normal human desire stuff. Yeah. You know, get acted out if we enter a relationship thinking monogamy is the only option Mm -hmm. and uh, I can't even talk about anything else because otherwise I'm going to be in trouble. So right. I often say to all couples, and I, I even say in particular, actually, straight couples, <laughs> say, yeah. talk about <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah. Because these days it's definitely more cool or more popular in some circles in the straight community to be into an open relationship. Yeah. And it's sort of progressive towns and cities and in communities, it's like um, monogamy is like still like lame and open relationships are almost seen as better or more evolved or something. So it is interesting. And I almost hear you saying, if I hear you right, I, I hear you saying the gay community might uh, be dealing with the open relationship thing a bit stronger. And so- Sometimes they, more friendly. I don't know if stronger, but I'd say okay. like there, there often is this conversation about like, a, a more thoughtful process around at what point do you close the boundary? What does it mean? Are we going to have an open relationship or a monogamous relationship? Or as Dan Savage says, a, a monogamish relationship, you know, like, <laughs> like what works for us? Yeah. You know? And, um, and I think that's what every couple really benefits from doing. It's like, what's going to work for us. Yeah. Cool. You mentioned Dan Savage. Um, I'm curious your take on him and cause he seems to be, uh, maybe I'm just not plugged into the gay community very well, but he seems like one of the premier leaders on relationships in general, but certainly gay relationships. Is there like, do you have a opinion on him or his message? Cause he's, he's pretty, pretty intense and edgy and funny and, and I'm guessing he's pretty limited in some ways also. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know him one. I'd love right. to know him better. Uh, I think it's less of an opinion that what I, I would say, I'm sure he speaks, you know, very well to certain people and to some people he doesn't represent their voice or they don't find him, you know, helpful or empowering. And I, I and I think that's just, you know, what it is. Um, I think that the voice he has carried in some ways and in a funny engaging way he's very real and he's been yeah, yeah. Really not afraid of naming stuff that a lot of people are uh, and a yeah. lot of us kind of sort of walk on eggshells with and particularly sexuality and particularly sort of like complex human desire and stuff that we all have to deal with um and um i think that he's really you know it's sort of his whole thing about good game and giving like that what's important in a partner is to be good game and giving, like to sort of be generous, be good to each other and to be game in the sense of like wanting the, your partner to, to be willing to experiment things with you, to be game, to sort of be open. Mm -hmm. um, we want you to have a rich sex life and a rich life in general. So what that will mean for each couple is very different. Yeah. It doesn't mean, you know, it works for every couple to have an open relationship at all. But I think as a stance, as value, he's been able to kind of say, look, can we all like look at each other without these assumptions? Can we all, like I said earlier, like remember that we don't own each other mm. and that love is about generosity and yeah. it's about being on an adventurous journey together. Uh, so, you know, I, I certainly appreciate his voice that way. And I think he's done a, a great job bringing that to uh, many gen generations and different communities. So um, it's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I agree. As he's controversial so and as uncomfortable as it can make certain folks. And, and as I said, in some ways, there are other folks that feel like he really doesn't represent them. And I think that's, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's true with 
people who listen to me, right? It's like, yeah, for some people I'm like, yeah, this is great. And other people are like, what? You know, yeah. cool. As we wind down here, uh, Jean, what, uh, if you had to give um, just a listener uh, sort of one of your favorite pieces of relationship advice, what, what's sort of the general or even really specific advice that you would give just to couples out there who are wanting to go to the next level or they're struggling a bit? Um, well, you know, I, I've said it already like two or three times just the past hour, but um, remember we don't own each other is one of the biggest one. Mm -hmm. And that don't take the person for granted. Um, the second one is give each other the benefit of the doubt. I mm. think that the single most kind of destructive thing that I've noticed in couples is when we stop giving each other the benefit of the doubt. So if you do something that hurts me, if you say something that's really off, I, I am going to try to hold myself to think like that really sucked. I'm really angry about that. And I'm sure you didn't mean to, or mm -hmm. you're still a good person and you still love me, but, but you, you did something that really is painful and that's not cool. And so, but I'm going to address you with sort of giving you the benefit of the doubt that you are a good person and you might have done something a little fucked up, but you're not fucked up. Yeah. And you might have yeah, done that's something great. that's unloving, but you do love me. And so, giving each other the benefit of the doubt, not taking each other personally, not taking each other for granted, remembering that we don't own each other, uh, just to so have been, at least to me, super helpful guiding principles. Yeah, thanks for that, that's beautiful. Pleasure. Um, Jean, I'm, I got two more questions. One, uh, just some advice I want from you. And then the other one is just to hear more about you and your TED Talk and things like that. So you may or may not know, but I'm, uh, started the relationship school and I'm on a mission to get romantic relationship education in the hands of really everybody. But ultimately I want to reach young people because it's not taught in school, how to work out our differences, how to own our needs, how to listen in a way that has people feel understood. And if you were to give me one piece of advice on what you think is the most important like uh, subject in the curriculum that I should teach young people, around romantic relationships, what, what would that be? Um, I don't think I would, I would say they're very different than what I just said. Like, I mean, I think that those sort of these kind of core, core kind of guiding principles about how to have respectful, um, open-minded, um, rich connections with someone else, with another human, are for me, the same thing. I mean, when I actually, when we do youth groups, when I talk, when I work with young couples, I mean, they're the same sort of principles. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking that I, I never want to make an assumption that what works for one generation works for the other, as much right. as hopefully we, we teach each other from one generation to the next. Um, I'm always super curious and working with a lot of trans youth and, and, and youth in general, uh, what they're saying is what they need to build, you know, a safe and healthy relationship. So um, that's just something I, I always go to. It's like, what are young people saying about, you know, what relationships mean to them? Mm -hmm. And I'm always, you know, struck to see that in the young people that we work with, on one hand, they're, of course, curious about romantic relationships and sexual relationships. And at the same time, um, are maybe a little more careful and slow about creating sort of lifelong romantic commitments. Like that, this sense of like, like I've yeah. got to find myself first. I've got to find my own grounding. I've got mm -hmm. to have my own friends, my family, my community, my, my vision, and, um, and then share that with someone else. So it's been interesting for me to learn what they have to teach me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm almost hearing like a, um, a layer of self-awareness in there. Does, does that, would you say that's true? Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, cool. Okay. And if you were, um, I guess I want to hear, just have you share with us a little bit more about what you're up to right now and, and uh, where people can find you. 
Great, yeah. So um, I was really honored and excited just a, a little while ago to do a, a TEDx talk about the gift of gender authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, it's very touching. I watched it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, and um, where, you know, I, I try to talk about uh, another kind of relationship, which is a, the relationship between parents and children, and in particular between um, cisgender parents and transgender children. And I try to really share my experience about helping families come to terms with um, the authentic gender of their kid and raising a trans kid healthy and safe and strong um, and how, what works and what helps a parent maybe go from like fear and shock and, and grief or feeling disoriented to love and acceptance, mm -hmm. and celebration and becoming a better person. And what's really interesting for me is that the conclusions that kind of we all came to, you know, the, the families I work with and myself is that it's not just, and we get that feedback a lot from parents who don't have transgender children, but who are in the journey of parenting themselves is that um, gender and gender socialization is a tricky thing, you know, and the question is like, um, should life begin with he or she? Like really, is that how we should get to know each other? Yeah. Um, do we know the gender of any kid um, before they tell us? Like, you know, what are the messages we give each other and we give our kids when we socialize in the pink or the blue box? And so uh, these yeah. I think are really questions that our families are, are struggling with, that schools are struggling with. So that's what I've been up to, kind of really thinking about that, asking people mm -hmm. how they feel about that and, and sharing their experience. Yeah, and, and definitely watch the, this is for the listener, definitely watch the TED Talk. It's really moving. I mean, good lessons in there for any parent, really. Yeah, and if you want to know more about um, the work of the Gender and Family Project, I invite you to check out our website and Facebook page. So our west, west side, website is ackerman.org slash gfb for gender and family project and we're also on facebook under gender and family project okay and we'll put those links in the show notes so you just have to click on those awesome okay great um and anything else gene in ter john in terms of uh finding you personally if people want to personally reach out to you where's the best place that they can do that absolutely so um my website johnmalpass.com uh has a contact um button so they can just do that and yeah. i'm happy to hear from folks all right excellent and if you're in new york city you can always hire him as your therapist <laughs> <laughs> anytime all right cool Great. good to hang out with you john okay take care man take care bye all right john malpas pretty cool right a lot of good stuff in this one and i'm so curious what you took away what was your takeaway and did you notice when I asked him, is there a real big difference between gay and straight relationships, what his response was? I thought that was cool and interesting there. And, you know, if there is one thing I took away that, because I'm always curious, I'm like, well, yeah, my, my sort of naivete at times is like, we're all struggling, no, no matter where your location is, as he called it, that he used the word location, in terms of sexual orientation, race, socioeconomic class, um, irregardless of location, we're all pretty challenged, especially in long-term relationships. And that's curious to me. That's kind of the human experience. And yeah, I just wanted to say that. So your action step is to certainly follow up with Jean and follow up with his work, what he's up to, particularly if you're interested in the conversations around gender. Go watch his TED Talk on raising like a transgender kid. It's really powerful. It's extremely moving. So check that out. That'll be in the show notes. And I love what he said. I, I, I sort of want to zero in on giving your partner the benefit of the doubt. All right. He said a lot of things like open, respectful, honest communication, be really forthright and um, talk openly about what you're thinking, if you want to have an open relationship or not. And this give the other person the benefit of the doubt. I and mean, that's actually hard to do <laughs> because so often we take it personally and we think our partner is doing something to us to hurt us. But if you can kind of look beyond that neurotic assumption, you can see that, especially if you're in a committed partnership, 
that most people are not intentionally trying to hurt you. And I think it's a really good attitude to have in a long-term relationship. And this is obviously if you're not in a really abusive or hostile relationship. So I'm not talking about that kind of relationship. I'm talking about the normal, everyday, challenging relationship outside of abuse. Okay. So action step is to give your partner the benefit of the doubt and to actually say that to them and own that that's hard for you. Look them right in the eyes and say, honey, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt more that you are, you actually do love me and you do care about me. I'm going to just assume that and I'm going to work on assuming that, but I notice I take things personally a lot and that's hard for me. Okay. So kind of have that aspiration and put it out on the table and be, look your partner right in the eye. Uh, if you're, if you're single, think about a future partner and think about your past partner and like, huh? Yeah. I didn't really give them the benefit of the doubt. I was always like, they're out to get me or I'm out to get them. Okay. Give them the benefit of the doubt. All right. Okay, guys, as always, it's been a real treat and I really appreciate your ears and you sharing this with a friend. It's, uh, it's always really interesting when someone comes up and tells me like at the conflict weekend, the embracing conflict weekend, a lot of people came up and said, yeah, I've been listening to your podcast for a year and I listen to it with my friend or my wife or we're couples and we listen to it in this town and we share it with each other. Uh, So thank you. It means a lot. It means that, you know, I'm having an impact here and um, I know that I am and it's fun to hear from you. Okay. One of the best ways you can, of course, let me know that is on iTunes. Leave us a review. It's actually preferable than sending us an email. I actually check those reviews often, and I read every single one of them. So uh, I'd love to read yours. And if you want to take a screenshot of it, send us an email with your review, then we'll give you a little coupon code for the merchandise store uh, at the Relationship School, okay, if you want to get a hat or something, all right? Okay, and then remember, Roots Community, if you want to practice. If you're the kind of person that knows that the way to get results is through practicing, then we'd love to have you join us at relationshipschool.net slash roots. And we'll see you on the other side.